This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Anderson Cowan, man. How are you doing, brother? I am doing fantastic, Alex. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, thank you for coming on the show, brother. We, uh, we've got, we've, uh, I was, I've been on your show. I've been a guest on your sh- on your radio show, uh, and or podcast yeah, and yeah. or podcast a little while ago when I had my first book out and I had a ball. Uh, that was back when we could actually uh-huh. sit next to each other um, without yeah. without uh, fear of uh, something happening. I'm kind of an isolationist, so I don't really mind any of this. This is nice to be able to just, you know, see people two dimensional. I don't like the 3D movies. I don't like 3D people. This is this works for me. <laughs> so, man, we're here. To, uh, I wanted you on the show because you made uh, a movie called Groupers, and uh, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, when we first came, when we first met through a mutual friend of ours, um, you were talking about this movie, and you were talking about what you wanted to do with it, and and you wanted some advice, and, and you were kind of just getting your feet wet. And this is like, what, a year and a half ago now? Yes. Something oh, like might, that. It might have been two years ago, Alex. And I, and I still think about that lunch that we had. <laughs> it, was my, it was my friend, your friend, and I, right? And yeah. uh, I, was, I didn't realize that I was a deer in the headlights at the time, but I was an absolute deer in the headlights. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I can only imagine what you were looking at when you were sitting across the table from me. Cause like I had made the movie, I was done, but I like, I didn't know what a film market was. Like you're like going, well, first thing you want to do is, you know, looking at AFM. I'm like, okay, uh, AFM, you're like, it's uh, the American film market. And I'm like, what, like a fish market? It's like a, like, like they sell movies there. You're like, yes, that's, that's how it works, Anderson. I, and I look back on that and the, the stuff that I have learned since that moment uh, is just unbelievable. And I'm embarrassed of that version of myself. I'm embarrassed <laughs> of many versions of myself, but that one in particular, man. I, I, and there's so many people like that, Alex, who make a movie and they have no idea. Most. Most. No mo- idea. I, I'm going to yeah. say most yeah. first-time filmmakers have absolutely no idea what to do with the film when they're done with it. And you, and you know what? That that leads me to this, which is it's no surprise at all that there are ma- as many sharks as there are out there, oh. you know, predatory distribu- dis- distributors and aggregators. And it makes perfect sense because there's so many douchebags like me who are like, I mean, for the first 20 years of my movie making career, I, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to find the guy that's going to help me or find the woman that's going to help me, uh, you know, get it out there. And I'm the artist and I just want to do my <laughs> own thing. And I don't want to be corrupted by the business side of things. And I actively <laughs> avoided it like it's like a total douche. And of course, there's going to be a whole like, you know, litany of, of predators just waiting to take advantage of people like me. So thank oh. God I found your show and started really reading up before I went out there in the murky waters. Oh no! Yeah, I remember I, when I was coming up. I always, I mean, I was, I always had some sort of business sense, but I just said, man, I really, when I was at my full douchiness, which there was like a, a, a level of high douche early on in my career, huh. where I had, yeah, I, yeah. I was so far up my own butt that it wasn't even funny. Uh, I would, I would say, right. like, I, I need my Brian Grazer. I need my Lawrence Bender. Uh-huh. You know, because don't find me. And the, and and, and right. by the way, and by the way, I was Ron Howard and Quentin Tarantino in those scenarios in my mind. So uh, let's just clarify that right then and there. <laughs> but it was I was good. I was talking about this the other day. Like Stanley Kubrick didn't get discovered. Like he went out there and pushed himself <laughs> to become. Like you don't get discovered. But I think that a lot of us start that way. Like I spent twenty years of my life, maybe thirty years of my life, uh, never same movie I, I everything was a film oh it's a fine film you know what i mean and i just look back and it's like dude it, it's just not it's not a good look it's not a good vibe and i think that you got to have some level of arrogance though to think that you have a voice enough to want to make a movie so it's good that you tame that when you're younger and then learn your uh you know your your limitability your limits and uh and then move from there but yeah uh, i have learned so much about business since do well, i'll tell you what i want to i'll just explain i've said this i think on the show before but um to explain to you the level of douchiness that I was at when I was in film school and coming out of film school, my product, my first production company was called, prepare yourself, wait for it, Uh-oh. a tour pictures. Oh no! <laughs> oh yeah! Oh no! <laughs> I had oh, it was called the tour pictures. The logo which uh-huh. I had made, which was on marble, I'm not kidding you, <laughs> with a 1996 3D movement camera where the shadow 
of the of the of the letters that spelled out a tour which just shift that was like big stuff back then when you can move a 3d line oh, that around. is pretty cool still i mean i'd be impressed by that yeah <laughs> and yeah. it but it was a tour well, pictures <laughs> Thank God, though, it didn't happen the way that we had uh, you know, fantasized oh. it to happen in our own minds. Because I, 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 I hate to think that of what a horrible douche I would have become. You know what I mean? Or, or would have continued to be if I, if it actually did all come true. You know? If I, when and a uh, lot of it, it's all it comes from insecurities, right? It, oh, it comes from yeah. knowing that you're a tiny, tiny little fish, and you got to have this chip on your shoulder and this bravado and believe in yourself because no one else is believing in you. So I, I, I understand where it comes from, but looking back at it, it's just like ah. Right. No, it, without question. I mean, if if um, like the book I was uh, my first book shooting for the mob, which I was on your show about, if that would have happened, if I would have made the ten or fifteen million dollar movie, if I would have worked with those stars, if I would have gone down that road, I I promise you, I would have self destructed. I, afterward, I wouldn't. My yeah. my ego would have not been able to handle that kind of attention, that kind of fame, that kind of anything. I would have been in. in I, yeah, uh, my body wouldn't have been able to take it. I, I would die. I think I would die from <laughs> drug overdose. I would just be out there every single night and I'd be a total flash in the pan. I'd make one thing and then I would just burn out from drugs and pro probably die. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So I don't understand when I see these like really young kids get early success. It's like good on you for being able to handle that because I know that, uh, you know, um, me in my early 20s was a, a, a nightmare, nightmare. Yeah, no question at all. Plus, Plus, you don't really have a whole lot to say when you're early in your, your early twenties, right? Like you haven't really lived <sighs> life enough to be able, telling large audiences, like you know, parts of the world and and parts of like stories and human interest stories. And I don't get it. I don't get a lot of it, Alex. I'm still learning. We all are. <laughs> we all are, man. We all are. Now, you jumped into filmmaking later in life. Um, so, can you can you give any advice to people out there that might be listening, who are scared to take the jump? Yeah, well, it's I, I hate to feel like it was later in life. I mean, I, I've i been making movies for 20 years, but I didn't really take a swing and actually uh, put myself up for rejection until later in life. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I got stuck in the radio world and that was that really slowed me down for, for I worked on on Loveline with uh, Adam Carolla, Dr. Drew for uh, almost 20 years and uh that stalled me, man. I remember Dr. Drew on a, on a regular basis going, "Dude, when are you gonna make your movie?" I'm like, "I know, but you know, it costs a lot of money, Drew. It then how you you don't just make a movie out of the blue." Um, but the dream never died. I I never lost interest in movies. I, I I'm I've got a bit of a uh, I'm a bit of I'm very obsessive about things, and uh, I've been in love with movies and the idea of movies and studying movies and watching tons of movies my entire my entire life, and I just kept kept the dream alive and I just kept pushing and pushing and I've been um, doing a couple two or three different movie shows weekly for the last number of years now and uh, I used one of those shows to to raise money to make my first feature uh, I've been writing all along I got like a number of scripts but they all cost you know a million plus so I, I finally wrote something that was cheap enough that I'd be able to raise the money for, uh, through my uh, through my audience which I did in making groupers which is pretty much just takes place at the bottom of an empty pool for the first half of the movie which it's a pretty cheap way to make a movie. Uh, yeah. If you just find Fairly. your, if you can find find the empty pool, you know. Exactly. Now, what made you make the jump? Like, what was that thing? Because I know a lot of guys out there, a lot of girls out there, just sitting there going, oh, "I just don't like." For me, it took me till I was forty to finally wake up after another deal went down for me to just say, "Screw it, I'm going to go make my first film." And I did. Thirty days later, I was shooting my movie. So that's what took for me. What What was it that thing that you like? I got it. I got it. Well, what was my What was my bottom? Um. Your catalyst. You know, it's kind of a, a yeah, a catalyst or my bottom. Of, every single morning, I would wake up, and the very first thing that I would hear in my head is, "You're a you're a loser. You have never made a movie. When are you going to make your first movie?" I I had made shorts, but I never made an actual. Movie. And uh, I I got together. I had a really good idea that I wanted to do uh, make a short out of. Um, it was about a guy who liked his personal space. It's actually pretty apt for what's going on right now. He was he was this guy that really liked his personal space, and he hated it when people came into his like little you know uh, uh, social distancing bubble. And uh, he would he would put on a, uh, a disguise to make him look like a pedophile to keep people away from him. And I said, I want to shoot this. So I got together with my buddy from film school. And as far as film school goes, the best thing that you can get out of film school are, are contacts that you can, you know, get together with 10, 15, 20 years later. Because when you get out of film school, they're not worth anything as contacts. They can be friends, but they're not going to be able to help you. One of my my best friend from film, film school, he's 
got a lot of connections and he had a great relationship over at Panavision. So I said, let's get a package from Panavision and, and shoot a short. And then uh, I looked into the, uh, the the production insurance, which I knew nothing about, right? And Panavision was like, yeah, we'll give you this $500,000 package of equipment for free for the weekend, but you need to have insurance. So I'm like, oh, Jesus. Turns out that the insurance for uh, two weeks costs almost as much as for the full year. So we got the insurance for the full year. We paid like 3500 bucks or whatever it was, and I we just shot shorts all, all year long. And that was really the catalyst to, you know, get my feet wet again after, you know, five years after film school and, and start figuring this out again. And uh, I just I, – every single day, it was like a mantra. And it, I, I didn't ask for it, Alex. I didn't want to hear the voice in my head calling me a loser every morning, but that's what I heard. And then once I made the movie – or once it was like in the works, uh, the next mantra was, you, you don't have a kid. You're never going to be a dad. What a loser. So it's like, <laughs> there's always something. You need to talk to that that voice, man. We all got that voice. Some of them are a little bit more aggressive than others. But yeah, I have the I have that yeah. voice too. And, you know, right now it's it's not easy, um, you know, hit, you can't hit the gym. So now you've got to like self-motivate. No. You got to self-motivate to actually, you know, do get out there, work out, stay set, not carb up. Not eat every snack mm-hmm. that you have gotten. It, it, it's it's tough right now. It's it's really tough yeah. in that sense. Um, but you know what? We're, we're in better shape than many people out there, uh, without yeah, question. Yeah, it's the best time to to be to be uh, in this situation with you know, which is you know, self quarantining and the stay at home orders. Like it, never in the history of humanity has there been a better time to have to do this with all the delivery services and the streaming oh. services and everything else. Absolutely. So, now you raised money through your audience, and you used a pitch video. Can you uh, can you tell me how you raised the money and how and how you kind of packaged this to your audience? Because the audience was basically fans of you and what you yeah. did, not specifically the film. It was about you. Yeah, they knew my sensibilities. They knew my taste in movies, uh, and they well, a lot of them just appreciated all of the. Uh, recommendations I'd given them over the years uh, on the film vault in particular, you know, every single week we talk about the three most recent movies we've seen. And then we do a top five list of like, uh, like last week we did top five supermarket scenes. Cause you know, we're all spending one of the only places we're allowed to go right now, supermarkets. So we kind of tailor it to what's going on. And uh, a lot of people uh, just wanted to see me, you know, take a swing and make my dream uh, a reality to actually make a feature film. And that's where a lot of the money comes from is you don't realize that people, a lot of people who are, aren't necessarily doing what they want to do, you know, nine to five, uh, appreciate a peer or, or somebody else still trying to make the dream happen. And they will, you know, help you out to, to make that, uh, make that go. So first thing I did was I got a producer uh, and I, you know, I've been sniffing around for years for somebody who might be able to be in this position and, and somebody, Max Landworth was my producer. And then he, once you get somebody who's very business minded, um, you're going to hopefully take the next steps and the next steps is raising the money. He had a, a bunch of different, uh, suggestions. One of which was to get a, a crowdfunding coach. This guy named Justin Giddings, mm-hmm. uh, was great. Cause he helped me with, uh, the Facebook cause I'm terrible at Facebook. I'm not a Facebook guy. He helped me with the Twitter. And, uh, I like making, the, t- you know, the Twitter, uh, the Facebook, the Instagram. Yeah, the Twitter, it's nice. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Twitter machine. Yeah, I just I thankfully I, I get to wax poetic, uh, you know, via podcast or what used to be radio shows. I, I get the word out with those. So I don't really see the value in social media because I don't want to, like, you know, say something on social media that I'm going to just repeat myself again on the on one of the shows. So I'm terrible with it all. I, I just and every time I get on there, Alex, I see somebody saying something that infuriates me. And I, I just I'm terrible social media. So it was great having this uh, this Justin guy to kind of walk me through it. And he had a bunch of great ideas. But really, it was my audience. You know, I, I had a built in audience that that helped propel me to get the uh, the 80. I was looking for seventy five thousand dollars and uh, we ended up getting eighty five thousand dollars. I don't really know how you go about it if you don't have a built in audience, especially nowadays where everyone's got a crowdfunding thing going. You know, mm-hmm. the crowdfunding racket has been pretty, pretty uh, run dry, I would say. Yeah, the audience building your own audience is is definitely um, something that needs to be happening, regardless, whatever your endeavors are uh, uh, in, in your filmmaking career. Having that audience is super, super valuable um, in every, yeah. every way possible. Um, now, when you wrote this script, but- though, did, go ahead. 
I was going to say one of the things that you can do, and you talk about this all the time, is you know look for your niche and you, and you look for your lane. And if you're good at it and you know what you're talking about, uh, that's a, that's a great approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, or in my case, I went for a, a hook, like a really easy to explain hook, something that was obnoxious, that was kind of you know going to stir the pot, and uh, I was able to get people on board pretty easily. And that was the Chinese finger traps. I mean, the whole premise of my movie was. Uh, just, uh, you know, those guys out there that claim homosexuality is a choice. Mm-hmm. Well, those were my targets. Uh, so I, the movie's about these two homophobic jocks who uh, get kidnapped and they're, they're, they are, are set out to, they, they must prove that homosexuality is a choice by being gay for each other. And there's a Chinese finger trap that connects the two of them. So it's incredibly sophomoric and childish <laughs> on, on that level. But then the movie goes much, much deeper and much farther as well. But it's a comedy. I, I was trying to make an important comedy. And uh, that's tough to do. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really tough to do. But uh, I, I pretty much made the movie that I wanted to make, which, uh, you know, is and there's no way I would have without all those shorts that I made uh, that one year when we got the uh, the production insurance. So that that helped a lot. Getting so your feet wet. You, so you mean you actually practiced your craft before you actually yeah, went out and did something big? No, stop. It, it is one of the toughest crafts to to practice. Like it's mm-hmm. it's not like playing catch. You know, or, or it's, the it's guitar. The batting. It's not playing guitar. Or the right. guitar, right? You don't get to watch YouTube videos showing you how to direct. Even though they'll they'll have you believe that Ron Howard will have you give him a bunch of money for his master class, and you know you, maybe you'll learn some of the stuff that we learned in film school. But a lot of that will too also just have you direct like everybody else, right? So it's to find your voice, to find your style, to figure out what if you're even good at it or not. Costs so much money, takes so much time, and and takes so many people. Uh, people's energy, not only just you, but you have to have all your friends and, and volunteers work on these things. It's, it's, it's crazy uh, how hard it is to practice this craft. Really now, when, now, when you were writing the script, um, did you? I'm assuming you had budget in mind, you know, before you wrote the no, script. Well, no, no, that's another problem that I had, and uh, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm writing right now, and I do have that in mind, and I do have marketing in mind as I'm writing it, but I'm not selling it out. I'm making sure that I'm not selling it out, but I am thinking about all those things, which is so, so valuable. Uh, I, I would just write because I was a purist, Alex. I, I wasn't gonna, you know, <laughs> write for business. I was, I don't care if and no one shows up. I'm making this movie for me, man. It's art. It's art. And every script I had written, like the first four scripts I had written, they probably you know, one to $5 million range. You know, I'm not thinking about that because I don't care. It's art. Yeah. Uh, This one, I was 30 pages in writing it for myself. When it dawned on me, I'm like, holy, holy, I I won't cuss, but I'm like, my God, this is a cheap script. I've never written anything this cheap. And that's when I realized, you know what? This is the first movie I'm going to actually be able to make. And I was excited. But that's also when the wheels started turning to the point where every word became precious because it was the first movie I wasn't writing just for myself. I knew that this was actually going to be on the big screen. And, and uh-huh. that made me uh, overthink, overthink everything for sure. So it took me a while to write it after I realized that. But no, I wasn't thinking budget until I was on about page 30 when I realized cheap. It is cheap. But I, I highly recommend that people just when you're daydreaming up ideas, try and think cheap and small. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, the chances of you, if you want to be a filmmaker and you're trying to get a movie packaged and sent out and, and try to raise financing and stuff, it is doable, but man, you've got to have all cylinders hitting at, you know, at full, full throttle and you really got to know what you're doing and you really got, it's, it's kind of like, you're going to thread that needle. You've got to have a lot of skilled people around you as well as yourself to hit that target. Uh, and a lot of filmmakers don't, they just like, clumsily like I just picked up the bat I've watched baseball forever but I just yeah, picked up yeah, the yeah. bat for the first time I'm walking up to to face a major league picture I'm sure it's going to be fine because I've seen it a mm. thousand times that's what you don't want to do and I think writing a script that you can actually manage yourself and shoot for 50 grand or less you know 100 grand or less uh, and yeah. do it all within your power uh, is you know I take that to the extreme with my first two films you know five grand and three grand you know to, yeah, insane to, to make those You're films 
<laughs> well, Has that but, been verified? Can we actually get some like uh, number crunchers to come in and verify Knock yourself that? out. It knock, makes no sense. Well, it, it, the <laughs> reason why it makes no sense is because I've spent 25 years putting so many tools in my own toolbox that I, I carried a lot yeah. of the weight myself. Oh, if I would have to pay everybody my jobs that I did, oh, forget it. Right. It, it, it just, yeah. Well, you, you would have a lot of money. It'd be your I, own. I mean, you I would, would I, have a lot of money. Uh, exactly. So, you know, that's the only way you could do stuff like that. Something that you actually that I learned from you early on was that, uh, you know, the cheaper, the better twofold. One, it's going to be easier to raise the money or find the money if it's cheap, obviously. And two, it's uh, the, the, the game is recouping that money so you can make the next one. And you got to be able to prove that. And uh, that's what I want to talk to you about next is the insanity that is we'll, we'll just go with Amazon because they're the, the, the big mm -hmm. player here. Uh, you know, my my movie groupers became available TVOD in November of 2019 uh and my distributor my distributor and i have no idea how it's performing we have no idea uh amazon does not have numbers for us until it's done with until the end of the second quarter of the first full quarter of business right which is crazy because of course they have the data why they don't share it with the filmmakers or the distributors or just even the aggregate with anybody is is beyond me. I'm a, a affiliate member with uh, Amazon with one of my shows. You know, you click through a little banner yeah, sure. and we get a percentage kick back to the show. I can see what people are buying pretty much in real time, exactly what they bought, what they paid for, it, what our percentages. They have they have the technology. Why they don't share this with filmmakers is beyond me. Do you have any ideas on this? Oh yeah, I mean, it makes it makes all the sense in the world. It's the reason why distributors in general um, and platforms in general take forever to pay because they're just they're it's like a bank. They're holding the cash, and they're kind of just paying I get it for that. It. And that, that's, that's fine. All. I mean, they can save the money. Yeah, and but give it to me eventually. Like even with my affiliate program, it takes them ninety days to pay. That's that's okay. I'm not gonna. But let me see what ads are working. Let me see what media, you know, social media posts are, are working, so that I can, you know, double down on those. It's it's th there's a serious problem with all of this uh, distribution in general. It's something that I have been racking my brain around, uh, 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 you know, about since last year. Uh, if not earlier, but really, really yeah. kind of done a deep dive, you know, ever since the, the distributor debacle and what happened with mm -hmm. them. And I was just like, there has to be a better way. So I'm I'm, I'm thinking and, and working on things myself, trying to figure out a better way of doing this. But it, it's lunacy. It's, lun it's lunacy because the cost of the product is so expensive. You know, it's not like a pen. It's not like a pen that yeah. cost me a few cents to make and it's going to take me, you know, 240 days to get my first payment for it. You know, it's not even on a, on a 60, 90, it's on 180 days, it's actually longer than that. So that's the thing. It's like the system is so flawed. It's so, you know, not set up for us as, as the creators that that's why I kind of just opted out of the whole system. And, you know, when I... When I um, made my first two films, I I partnered with a distributor that you know Indie Rights, who I've worked with, and but they're just one revenue stream where I have multiple revenue streams coming in from my movies um, through my platform and through other products and other services right. and things that I do. And that's why I opted out of it, and I think that is the only way moving forward is you have to create other revenue streams from your your art in order to make it. I mean, look at the music industry. Right now, and right now, before the way they were making money was touring uh, and yeah. live shows and appearances. So I can't even imagine what is going to happen to musicians moving forward uh, because now their only way to make money is now going to be virtual, you know, virtual live um performances no this will this will end though i mean this isn't forever this will no end, it, it is with younger people no no of course it will end but the point is that it it's gonna take a while and even the hangover of what's going on right now is gonna yeah. take at least till next year so for this yeah. rest of this year i don't see any there's no Lollapalooza this year you know there's no, no. i mean regardless i mean if it, it's gonna take time before we get back to normal i'm not going to a movie theater this year i don't care what they say you know so you know, not this year. I will. I, I'll be there. 
I know you will. You sir. open up those movie theaters and I'm going to be there. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, it really concerns me and upsets me with all these people saying, hey, who needs theaters? You know, it's no. great. Just pay 20 bucks. Watch it at home. It's like, no, no, that's not what movies are. I mean, not to get douchey again and get, you know, like back to auteur pictures again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, movies aren't special unless they're an event in a theater for a limited amount of time. You know what I mean? But I, that's it, for our, but that's for have, our generation, though. That's for our generation, not for a whole other generation okay, that's so, grown up. So let me ask you this, Alex, like if they're not events that you can only go to and see them the way that they were made to be seen, which mm -hmm. is in a theater, when 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 these movies are being mixed together for their sound and uh, the pictures being color time, they're doing that on big screens with Atmos uh, oh, I know. speakers. I mean, yes. They're not doing it and for your iPod, uh, you know, Correct. For, your, for your iPad, your face. So you you go to see it the way that it was intended to be seen and you can only see it that way for a limited amount of time, which makes it special. If that's not an option anymore, then do we really even need new movies? Maybe maybe one a month, two a month, because we have a hundred years worth of movies that most people have never seen that are going to get us through the day. You know what I mean? Even I'll, me as a movie lover. I'll tell I'll tell you what. Look, it's yeah, a tra it's a tra it's a travesty to watch Star Wars on your iPhone, like that. Mm -hmm. You know, watching any Nolan film, any Kubrick film, on a iPhone is a travesty. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Th there, there, are, there are things like I actually had the chance to see Full Metal Jacket in the theater um, with 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 um, I'm going to douche out a little bit here. But I had um, Kubrick's um, right hand man, the guy who made the movie filmmaker, like the, that documentary. Uh -huh. Yeah, huh? Yeah. yeah, he was he was sitting right behind me and I got to talk uh, to him afterwards. And I nice. watched and I watched Full Metal Jacket with him and Matthew Modine in the, in the theater. And I was just like, oh, bitch. this is awesome and i'd never seen full metal jacket in the theater i'd only seen it on dvd and on vhs and all that stuff over the huh. years and it was just like wow this is insane like watching 2001 at home is awesome but watching it in the theater like i saw lawrence of arabia at a theater in 70 million i saw it at cinerama dome yeah so yeah, like, yeah so like the intermission and everything yeah exactly I still didn't so the thing is, but that's that's an event. And for a generation like you and me who were raised on that, that makes sense. But there's a whole generation of filmmakers, and not filmmakers, but yeah, well, not, oh, yeah, filmmakers and film lovers who right. are watching Irishman, yeah. a Scorsese film yeah. on their iPhone. And I get that. And I get the generational thing. And I don't want to come off like the old man, but it's, it's about the relationship that you have with the movie and how it's fleeting. And you can only see it for that period of time in that theater. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you can go and have, you're a little intimate moment with that movie. And like, there, there'll be a movie that'll come out once every five years. And I'm like, I'm so into it. I'll see it four or five times in the theater. And I, and it's, it's, it's excitement of knowing uh, that, like, you know, it's only going to be around for another week in the theater. You better go see it one last time and have, you know, that intimate. Mo sure. You can watch it countless times in, you know, in your house, but it's not, it's not the, it's like, it's like kissing someone as opposed to actually, you know, having sex with them. No, I, I get right. it. I, I get it completely. And I do personally believe that the theater experience will stay alive in one way, shape or form. Uh, I don't yeah. in, in the next 20 years, man, I don't see the theatrical experience maintaining what we knew it oh, as, no. but it will be, it will yeah. always be there. The IMAX, you can't compete with IMAX. You can't compete with the theatrical Perhaps experience. Out. Yeah, easy. I need Alamo Draft House to get a uh, IMAX because I do think that they're going to be one of those sole survivors when all this yeah, is said and done I, I, because agreed. they cater to them. they cater to people that like you know you and I. Yeah, exactly. So I think it will be in one way, shape, or form, but I don't think it will have. And look, this this whole event that we're going through right now has really proven the fact that you know people are going to after this event after this blows over, people will want to go out, people will want to go back to the movies, but there's going to be a nice large percentage of people going to go. You know what? I'll just I'll just stay yeah. home unless it's a huge event like and you have to go see it in the theater. Well, even before this, Alex, it was like going... I'd go to my AMC theater down the street and uh, I, you know, there'd be four or five people there at 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night, like young people. And I would I would wonder, like, I'd be happy to see people there, but I'd, I'd be like, how do they sell Make this money. to themselves that they think it's a good idea to go watch like an $18 movie? Once when they could, you know, have that that pays for two months of Netflix with unlimited movies. Like it, it's the model's broken and, and it needs to be fixed and changed and saved somehow. And uh, I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. And, and I think what's going on right now with look, I've always said this about 
uh, we're going off tangent here, but I've always said that the theater in general, the whole industry has had a very combative relationship with yes. the customer, with overpriced food, uh, bad experience for a lot of those years. They've actually now upped their experience because they had to, not because they wanted to, because they had to compete. Like, you know, now you can sit in plush seats and everything is clean yeah. and the sound is impeccable and the screen is great and all of that stuff. That took years, decades for that to come up and they had to do it because they're like, well, people don't need us anymore. But there's still this combative relationship with like, look, it's like going into an airport and buying a soda. I'm like, do you not know what things cost outside? Like, yeah. I don't know. Like, so yeah. there's that whole, and then the price of the tickets and everything. So it's always been very combative. So now like AMC, who is about to go bankrupt any day now, is like, oh, we're not going to yeah. show any more Universal movies because they said something right. negative about us because Troll 2 made uh, $100 million on streaming. And I'm going, are you... If, if I was the theaters, I would do everything in my power to try to ingratiate myself to a studio like Universal, yeah. who's still releasing major tent poles. Like, are you like Have without you this? Alex, what's really funny is the biggest AMC in LA is actually yes, it, at yeah, the Universal City Walk. Well, yeah. How is that going to work? It's so what's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that whole exchange was so effing childish, and it's just it's it shows you that the, the people well, at the top still don't know nothing. You know what I mean? Like the fact that they got so petty, so quick, it's just it's mind blowing. It's it's basically the guy. It's it's basically oh, it's, it's the guys who had the horse and buggy guys who 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 used to build the buggies, and they're like, well, this upstart yeah. automobile is ridiculous, car. or yeah. the car, nobody wants that, it's unreliable, it's all this, and that same yeah. thing happened with kerosene lamps versus electricity. Like, they, you, you yeah. it, it is what it is. Streaming is here, regardless whether you like it or not. It, it is, it's saving us right now um, in this experience that we're going through right now without it. And I think so many more people are going to get so much more <clears throat> comfortable with streaming and having it as part of their life and getting great content. They're going to go, well, why? I don't need to go to the theater maybe once a year, maybe twice a year as a special event, but I'm not going monthly. That's what they'll say. Yeah. So, and, and by the way, the whole industry was already, you could just see it was dropping. It was dropping and dropping and dropping in, in the, and the international ticket sales were the only thing that were really keeping it up. The theatrical, I mean, remember, I remember a day when the U.S. market was seventy or eighty percent, and international was twenty. And now it's the opposite, yeah. as as you can see with films that have Asian actors and Chinese themes for no apparent reason, uh, because they need to sell it mm -hmm. in China, um, which is a huge market right. now. So the the world is upside down, and I don't, you know, it's this happens in every industry. The old guard holds on as long as they can to the way things were. Until they have no other choice, they're blockbuster basically. I think movie theaters right now yeah. are blockbuster. I don't think they'll go away completely, but I, I think by the way, by the end of this thing, we're going to lose some, but we're we're going to lose a lot of screens. They're, oh yeah, there's some movie theaters for sure that have closed and will never open up again. I yeah. I don't doubt that at all. And even before all this, Alex, uh, the my my big theater down the street from me is AMC 16, and I love paying twenty twenty three bucks a month to be able to see three new releases yeah. each week for twenty three bucks a month. It was very affordable for me for somebody like me who watches movies all the time. But there, it's a, it's attached to a, a mall that uh, has just been abandoned. It's kind of this crazy dead mall where like every single store is gone. Uh, it's actually where they shot Valley Girl that came out uh, just recently. Anyways. Um, they're making a new theater. AMC's moving across the street to a, a, a mall that's living, uh, but they're going from 16 screens to 12 screens. So I mean, it's all it was. This is that's before all of this. That's before the pandemic. So it, they're we are trending to less screens in this country, at least. Um, yeah. it, which it, you know, it's it's inevitable. I get it. Yeah. No. Without question. You know? Look. We, we, look. Remember the film and digital conversation? I mean that that yeah. that whole thing. That took forever to finally figure out to the point where now everyone was like, well, you know, Red showed up and changed the game. And then Aerie mm -hmm. took them forever to finally catch up. And now they, yeah. they, they're they like, well, we're not going to go after the main market. We're going to go after the professionals. And that's all we're going to do. Well, let Red, you know, have the dentists buy their cameras and shoot their movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's who they're aiming at. So, but look, I remember when that came up and when people were still arguing film versus digital and all this stuff, and you could have, we could still have that argument about it now, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. At the end of the day, people are going to shoot digitally. If they want to shoot film, 
Go for it. I've shot film. I love film, but I I, I, I got it tattooed on my arm. I mean, I have 35 millimeter tattooed on my on my arm. I love the idea. Oh, I remember of, you know, celluloid. The, the smell, the smell of the roll, like when you opened it. Um, the after uh, yeah, it was it, you know I remember changing the I, ch- I remember changing the you know in the bag and going to the to the lab and dropping it off, but un- but very much like um blo- like video stores, I have a nostalgic relationship with video stores i wouldn't go back like if no, there was a video no, no. store down the street i'm not gonna go rent my movies there because it doesn't make sense i have a nostalgic feeling for what i felt when i was at that right. point and i worked at a video store and i love right. that that whole but that was that time and yeah, same thing goes for this i get that for sure I, I worked at a video store and i you know i love that time and it's a it's an it's a it's a bygone era and I, and I get that, but I'm hearing what I'm hearing. And at least it's in the headlines and it's in the media right now is uh, who needs movie theaters. You're not going to see packed. You know, you're never going to see a sold out movie theater again. Uh, Movie theaters are a thing of the past. And I, I just totally disagree with that. Uh, I think that there is a portion of us that still appreciate the movie theater and always will. And it's not an old thing. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a right thing because if, if there is no movie theater experience, like I was so happy that groupers got a, theatrical release i mean that was a dream come getting the distribution deal uh was great but getting that theatrical release that made it in my mind like i actually made a real movie that had a theatrical release you get that but if you don't have that option then it's just tv i mean and tarantino said it a few years ago that's why he's been threatening to uh, retire for all these years is because he's like we're not making movies anymore we're just making you know long tv shows which essentially i mean there's something to be said about that so, no, I, I, I agree with them. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think um, I don't I, I look if you don't believe that movie theaters are going to be packed again. Wait till the next Avengers shows up. Yeah. You know, wait till well, the next day. Uh, uh, off AMC, right? Yeah. Even look, AMC could be pissed off as much as they want. They need the movies. They need Avengers. They yeah. need Disney. They need Disney product. They need Warner Brother product. They need, you know, the next Harry Potter, whatever they're going to. People will show up. Will it be as big of a pie as it used to be? No, I think they'll be different. Is the window going to be different? Yes. You know, will you will there be a 30 day window as opposed to this 90 day window that movie theaters have been trying to go for forever? I think it's going to that window is going to change and they're going to have to renegotiate. If not, they're just going to die. They're just not going to yeah. make it because theaters need Hollywood. Hollywood doesn't need theaters at this point. Uh, uh yeah, I think that the the, the worldwide we'll we'll see i mean right now we're all going off of what trolls 2 did you know what i mean like well no and that's a very what... unique and that's a very unique yeah that's the thing i said to, to uh, i was talking to somebody else earlier today i said look trolls 2 is a very unique film in the sense that it's a low-hanging fruit meaning it was a equivalent low budget movie 90 million bucks for a for an animated film is fairly affordable you know for for them and it's it's like, well, we could either shelve it or we could put it out there. And it's a kid's movie and it's in the middle of a yeah. pandemic and, and yeah. parents are going crazy. It, may, it, it checked off a lot of boxes and that's why it did as yeah. well as it did. But what will happen when Bond shows up? Like, I think if Bond, if like if we if if this thing does keep going and nobody goes, if the theaters don't open up for until November and you mm-hmm. put Bond on a T, I call it premium TVOD. I'm, VOD, yeah, yeah, t- yeah I'm, I'm gonna pay 20 bucks to see it and i'm sure a lot of people will like so it hasn't really been tested yet let's throw a real tent pole up there let's yeah. see what happens like can't but i like i said earlier like tyson fights back in the day were making five six hundred million dollars in one night that was a party thing too that was an event that you have an event at your house and you'd host it right right so yeah. why wouldn't this be why can't, i think that's where this premium tvod could go for these giant event movies um yeah but and then you, be got, interesting. you get you gotta have to tap into the fomo too because like i said there's oh. so much entertainment so much entertainment you gotta have it so that the kids don't want to go to school on monday unless they've seen it because they don't want to be left out of the conversation like and, and then, there's very then few what of those kind of movies. Are, are you making when that's what your the the main motivating factor is to create FOMO? And I guess they're already doing that. Yeah, I was about to say, what, have you not been paying attention to Hollywood yeah. over the last decade? That's what they do. <laughs> last hundred years, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what they do, man. <laughs> uh, well, we went a little bit off. We went a little bit off uh, off target here, but um, but you said you got to distribute it with your film. What yeah. um, what, who's your, if you don't mind me asking, what's your relationship with the distributor? Are you making any money with them? 
I don't know, because uh, I'm still waiting for Amazon and iTunes and all of those to you know show their reports. Uh, we we find out for the movie that uh, got released in uh, November came out in theaters I think October, mm-hmm. and then it got uh, and then it went to uh, TVOD. Uh, and then it's on AVOD as well. I'll, I'll let you know where it is, uh, all the different places. But that was November. We don't find out what it did, how it's done business until July, from what I understand. Like sometime in July, we'll figure that out. But uh, I I landed with Terror Films, who was the only – I got uh, five offers from five different distributors. And I can tell you the first offer I got, I would have jumped at had I not known what I was doing a little bit, had I not listened to people like you. And uh, What was you know, that really deal? What, what was that deal, by the way? Uh, it was 30 70 split to me and um it was it was a very large distributor uh who has a whole bunch of movies and mm-hmm. i didn't get very far down the path went back and forth with them a little bit and then another distributor that i was very familiar with came in and they they wanted it so i'm thinking great two big names that i could you know say hey my movie's with so and so you know and uh and then the third guy uh no actually he was the fourth guy that came in i was terror films um, I also had a, a deal with with. I don't want to say any of the names. Sure, you don't have to, say, mean, you don't have to I, say the names. But the um, but so let me ask you a question. With these other deals that you turned down, was there minimum? There was no minimum guarantee, so you weren't getting paid any money. Up no, no line. MGs. Not no not MGs. With tiny little, no, yeah. but was there? What was the? Uh, was there a marketing cap? And also, what was the the t- the terms length length of the agreements? Just curious. I'd have to I'd have to pull it up, Alex. And also, I I can tell you that um, I had Glenn. Um, with Circus Road, yeah, films. yeah, Glenn, yeah, front uh, of the show, front of the show, Glenn Reynolds, great guy. And what's funny is I I got him out of AFM. Kind of, uh, I met him outside of AFM. We set up a meeting and met down the street at AFM because he didn't even go to AFM that year. And uh, I was all willing to do the deal with him. And he was gonna, you know, find he was gonna be my rep, my rep. And I'm listening to you talk to Linda with Indie Rights. Yeah, and you're doing an interview with her, right? And uh, you guys are talking about uh, reps and producers reps and 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 how and and sellers reps and how they they just rip people off left and right and if anyone asks for money up front run they are they're bad people they're just there to take your money and I'm like you know what I'm not signing with this Glenn guy I'll, I'll never forget I was showing my movie in Orange County the next the, uh, later that night and I was getting ready for uh, to show my movie because I four walled it first before I got the distribution deal and I'm in my uh, my hotel at the Hyatt out in Orange County just listening to you guys talk and I'm like I'm not gonna I'm I'm breaking off this deal with Glenn and then she says or you say unless it's somebody like Glenn I'm like oh, <laughs> I'm back in, back in. <laughs> well there's very few there's Glenn very great. Glenn's great and there's very few producers reps who actually do what they say they're going to do who are fair who care um there's I can count them on one hand so they're they're very yeah, very few fantastic and as a first timer, I can say if you if you're lucky enough to have somebody like Glenn who who likes your film and they they want to get it out there for you, they want to work with you. He was great because I never felt like any offer he brought me was going to be taken full advantage or oh, I was going to get screwed. And he'd go through with a long form and he'd cross things and 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 highlight things that were an issue. Um, and uh, ultimately, though, what kind of made sense was that when Terror Films came, Joe Dane with Terror Films, I know yeah. you've had him on since sure. I, since I signed with. Um, I took his call just to be courteous because I'm like, who am I? You know, I had no interest. I, I saw his 50 50 split. I never heard of them. They're a horror film uh, distributor. I'm like, not a right fit, but, you know, I'll take his 15 minute phone call because that'd be rude. And who the hell am I? I'm a first time filmmaker. I should be lucky that anybody wants to even look at my film, right? Talk to Joe. Two hours goes by. I'm talking to Joe and I just love everything he's saying. And because of the things that I heard from you and other horror stories that I had read about, you know, to, uh, first time filmmakers never seen a dime and never having any idea what their film is doing. Um, Joe's business model is built in that you are going to see at least something because you get 50%. There are no caps. There's you know, all the marketing's on him. Any business the movie does, I see 50% of it automatically. Mm-hmm. There's no recoupables for him. It's just straight up. So if the your movie partners, does 10, your partners, your partners, your partners, basically. Exactly. So if it, you know, if it does two rentals at five bucks a pop, Amazon's going to take their 50 and then I'm going to split the five dollars with Joe and I'm going to get I'm going to get a list two dollars and 50 cents because I know people rented the movie. So that's nice to know. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, Joe's Joe's. Yeah, I've had Joe on the on the on the show. And um, and if you're a member of the protect yourself from a predatory film distributors and aggregator Facebook group, Joe is a very vocal voice in that group. Yes. <laughs> 
and has been since the beginning with Distribber uh, and that whole debacle, which is how we met originally. Um, uh, but yeah, man, look, it's, it's, it's not perfect. For, you know, his model is not perfect for everybody, uh, but it is for right. some people. And there, like I said, there's a handful of people that I can count on one hand as far as distributors and producers, rep sales agents and things like that, that I would trust and go, you know what? These are the guys, there's very, very few. So the majority, just understand the majority of who you deal with is going to be, um, it's going to be perfect. I was like, listen, I was listening. I just had a conversation, I had a consult with a filmmaker. I was coaching him through, um, through a distribution deal and they had uh, they had a million dollar plus minimum guarantee offer on the table Jesus. the wait a minute wait a minute and the movie was made for about like, seven eight hundred thousand okay it was with a very it was two deals two million dollar plus deals on the table both very well-known companies if i said their names you know who they were and it was an MG, a million dollar MG. That's how good his film was. He turned them both down. And do you know why he turned them both down? Because no. by the time, like it was so much Mickey Mouse BS on when he got paid and how the, the payment, it was just so, and the, the, the deliverables list that he had to set up. And he's like, at the end of the day, I was like, I'm never going to see this. Even though I, they say I'm going to get an MG, it's going to take six months to a year right. before I even get the, the way first... they do business. Right. And it was just like, yeah. but that's standard practice. That is what business yeah. as usual is in the entertainment industry. So <clears throat> they, they, I think the distribution space in general has had such a long run of, Hey, it's us or nothing kind of attitude yeah. that they just like, we're just going to abuse you. And if you don't like it, there's another 5,000 movies sitting right behind you that are willing to yeah. do it. So we don't really care if you know. take it or not. And that's the, that's the world we live in. So that's why I've been, you know, that's been preaching the film entrepreneurial method and, and figuring out other ways for filmmakers to make money and to sustain themselves uh, as a career before they can get, you know, uh, unless they want to eventually get hired on to work for hire at a big studio or work, work on TV or, or do something else like that. But it's it's brutal out there. It is so brutal. So, so anytime I talk to a filmmaker and they have a deal, I'm like, give me the details. I want details. Is you know off the record. Tell me what you, how much you mid make, who you make, because I like to hear all this. That's why I used to love going to AFM. I'm not going this year probably, um, but um, <laughs> but I used to go. I loved going to AFM because I, I would get stopped every five feet by somebody or a filmmaker who was like, hey, here's my deal, and they would tell me their deals. Yeah. So I would really get a feeling for what. The, and I've got some of the deals I heard. I just 25 year deals, 25 yeah, year deals. That's another, you know what? That, that one uh, of them I was a 25 year deal. One of the uh, offers that I got <laughs> was 25. With Joe, I, it's a five year deal, which was by far the lowest. Like it was. It's one of the lowest. I, yeah. I, I got 15, 20, and 25 year deals offered to me, except for indie rights, which was a whole different ball game. And that's almost like self distribution. Um, very close, yeah. And I'm and I'm with yeah. indie. I'm with indie rights and Linda and Michael, and they they're great. They're great. Um, yeah. And they, and they um, you know, I got my first check. Oh, cool. Already? Was, Wait, you're after me, though. No, no, but I got my first check from This Is Meg. Oh, okay. So it was That's This a while Is Meg. Yeah. yeah, so so they just picked that up, and that got released first before On the Corner of Ego did. And it's not a lot, but I got something. You got something, yeah, because I, I heard you talking with the original guy, the, the, the distributor guy, years ago. Uh, and he was talking about how why he did why he created Distributor is because he yeah he had produced ten movies and he never saw a dime for any of them and that was his that was his bottom I guess like that was his catalyst mm -hmm. to actually go out and create a new model a, a, mm -hmm. a way for filmmakers to not have to deal with that and it's kind of ironic now that here we sit with uh, last time I was supposed to the first time I was supposed to do your show that was the day that uh, Distributor blew up and then the second time we rescheduled that was the day that Tom Hanks got coronavirus. <laughs> So I'm glad that here we are uh, finally recording no pandemics and no major like scandals in Hollywood uh, to, to No, it's like yeah, when we called last time I'm like dude um we can record this but man like I'm, I'm my mind's not Both in it the, the like, world yeah. the world is coming to an end right now we don't know what's going on probably not the best time to do this interview and it was literally <laughs> the day that they canceled NBA or suspended NBA yeah, exactly. it was the day that it became real right Right um 
Before I forget, Alex, let me let me give a little piece of advice to you too, because I, I know you have a lot of people who are like like uh, me right now, or like yeah. like the way I was, and just uh, you know, and I and I, I don't want to spare people from twenty years of thinking that they're going to be discovered or thinking that it's going to happen just because you know I got stories to tell. I'm a smart guy. I'm going to be able to. I'm going to change the world. You know what? Because that doesn't work. And part of the reason why I was so gun shy is because I I got a, an appreciation for Stanley Kubrick once again to go back to him at yeah. a young age an mm -hmm. unhealthy obsession with his movies his method reading books on him obsessing about uh, Stanley Kubrick and then you get in your head and there's no way you're going to make anything that looks like Stanley Kubrick so mm -hmm. I was exceptionally intimidated now a lot of the filmmakers that I love like they grew up watching like Roger Corman movies or you know like uh, John Carpenter movies attainable movies movies that you and your friends can go make like in the backyard with some fun effects i wish i wish that i had gone down that path i would have made my first movie probably 10 years earlier you know that's the same that's the same thing for me like i didn't make my first feature even though i had the skill set probably a decade earlier yeah. but i didn't do it purely because i was up my own ass i i, I just like i need my first movie's got to be reservoir dogs it's got to be mariachi yeah. it's got to be something that comes out and explodes and and i put so much pressure on it that it was just no way it could ever live up to it so it was just right. excuses because i was scared and then finally yeah. I, I, it was just the bottom line it was just excuses for you i need five million yourself. I need five yeah. million. I need. I can't work without five million. You know, yeah. I have to have that and like that kind of stuff. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's childish. It really is childish. Yeah, yeah. And I went to the uh, complete op opposite end. I'm like, you know what? Five grand. Screw it. Boom. Yeah. Then, yeah. Then I made this for this paltry amount of money, and like I'm in awe of what you did with the amount of money you had. I mean, that's way more impressive than if you made you know some shoot 'em up five million dollar movie. Whatever. I've seen that before. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you know what the thing is, man. I know I know, I know a lot of people in the industry who who you know were, are working directors, and and they're you know they're employees, and you know they're very well paid employees, but they're employees. So when the boss doesn't have work for you, you're done, and that's a very weird place to be. And I've always I've always been I've been fired from both jobs I've ever had. Uh, in this industry, mm -hmm. uh, as an as a, as a staffer, very proud of my firings, and uh, I've <laughs> always been self self uh, employed, had, running my own company because I always wanted my fate to be in my own hands in one way, shape, or form. Yeah. And that's the whole method of the film entrepreneur is to control as much of the revenue, control the system as much as humanly possible. Because I feel it's it's just insane to spend a hundred thousand dollars. Um, or 200000 or half a million dollars and just magically trust somebody here. I expect to yeah. check in six months. That is such a scary thing. That's not a good business sense. It's not a good no. business in general. So I, that's what I've been trying to preach for as long as possible. And nobody's ever said that like independent film uh, is a, a smart <laughs> decision. Business. Or it's, it's <laughs> It's a, it's a it's a business that kind of came out of necessity because the studios, you know, they were in control of everything. And there was a bunch of people like you and I and other filmmakers going, hey, I got something to say. I, I like to make one of those pictures. Right. So we had to kind of do it on our own over here. And then the, here come the sharks like, oh, you want to do it on your own? OK, we'll sign right here. We'll help you. It makes here, perfect it'll be sense. Fine. It'll be it'll be yeah. fine. I promise you everything will be fine. Um, yeah. Now, you also went down the festival circuit with this film a little bit. Is there anything yeah. you done differently? Uh, that anything that I would have done differently? Yes, I, I would have cut my movie so that it was less than 90 minutes. I think that's uh, another very important thing if you're a first-time filmmaker and you're trying to get on the festival circuit. Uh, they love the shorter movies. They love movies that are like 75, 88 minutes. My movie is a little fat for an independent movie. It's 109 minutes, hour and 49 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that was probably a problem. We ended up um, premiering at Cinequest, which was really, really yeah. good. Uh, that's so did a, I. You know, top 10 festival right in the u.s so i was happy with uh with with where we premiered and thank god we both got our movies in before all this i feel so bad for people who oh, went and south through by, what, and south what by. you oh. go through oh. and then you get in your dreams are coming true and then this happens like i can't believe because usually that happens to me alex i can't believe that i dodged this bullet somehow but yeah so i uh, went down the festival circuit and that's fun i mean you really gotta if you've not done this before um know that you have to be prepared to just be rejected 
all the time and you never know when it's going to happen like uh, and it and it hurts as much as being dumped by a girlfriend uh if you if you have your dream of you know getting into sundance or oh. or south by and you never know where you're going to be when that email comes in so you'll be you know, sitting in my case a lot of time i'd be out to eat with my wife and my you know one-year-old son at the time having a great time and then i'd get a little email notification i'd look oh my heart was we regret okay, we regret gotta... to inform you we regret to inform yeah. you it's not you so gonna... it's it's not you it's us yeah, it's just, there are so many good ones this year. Yeah, it's it's the same form letter. And then I get really angry. I think Slam Dances had like a bunch of typos, which I was furious. Like you couldn't even bother to reread your rejection letter. Uh, there's a great documentary called Official Rejection, which I, yeah, I highly yeah. recommend people yeah. watch before actually going down that road. Because if you're sensitive, I'm a sensitive little guy. I really am. I hate rejection more than most people probably do. And uh, it would just, you know, ruin your day like you know, for the rest of your day. And you never know when it's... And then I was getting rejection letters from festivals I had forgotten that I had even submitted to, right? Which is like... And it's then, like... Uh, Houston... <laughs> <laughs> it's like the International Film Festival. They sent me a letter uh, to my 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 box. I went out to my 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 mailbox, and there was a letter in there from the Houston. I'm thinking, oh my god, they sent a letter. This is awesome. We regret to inform you. And then a week later, they sent another one with the same exact letter. They doubled me up for whatever. So I got two rejections from those guys. But you just have to be prepared for lots of no's, just nonstop. Nope, we are not interested. Yep. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, though. Where do you think you know? Where do you think the festivals are going to go now, man? Because they are not. You know, people are. Uh, if you think it's rough getting to go see the Avengers in the theater, I, these smaller festivals, man, I don't think they're going to be able to survive moving forward, yeah, especially well, this I year. Think a nice, a nice uh, cleansing. Cleansing, don't we? Yeah, I mean, there's more festivals than there are new movies. Uh, there really are, right? Yeah, no, no, there, there, there is. I think there might be a gluttony of, of festivals, but, but in general, though, the, the importance of these bigger festivals. It's. I mean, before it was everything, you know. And if you got into Sundance or Slam Dance, it really did mean a whole lot. And don't get me wrong, it still does, but it doesn't guarantee yeah. anything, at no, all, no, no. at all. So now, all of a sudden, we're in a world where South by got canceled, and Tribeca yeah. will be canceled, and Cannes will be canceled, and I promise you, Sundance will probably be canceled next year as well. It probably won't go on, uh, because I yeah. don't think we're going to be out of this by January. Not to the point uh, where they're going to. What they're gonna? No, they'll have. come up with some way that right digitally. There has to be something. It's all gonna be digital, digital screenings and that kind of thing. And yeah, it's but still that, gonna have the austere. But to that's an only. Extent. But that's only to that's only to those top ten fests. Like, how about the rest yeah. of the thousands that don't have that kind of cachet and don't have that kind of email list or following? You know, people will log into Sundance. Will they log into you know a smaller festival? You know, regional like the I always said the Moose Jaw. International Film Festival, which doesn't yeah. exist, you know. So, will they sign up right. for the, the Moose Jaws Film Festival somewhere in Ottawa? You know, like it's not. I'm not sure if they Are you will. Sure, it doesn't exist. It I hope not. Does. I hope. I hope it, it doesn't. Does. If it does, I, I apologize. Shocked. I was appalled to see it. I think there is 2,500 to 3,500 film festivals actually, uh, around the world. A, no, it's about five to six thousand. It's about five to six thousand uh, film festivals okay, around so the world. Maybe it's gone up that much since I was uh, in the festival circuit two years ago. I don't know. Yeah, to, to, to the numbers that I've seen, it was it's around five to six thousand worldwide, uh, including online festivals and all these other kind of things as well. I I honestly, as much as I love movies, and I think that I've made that pretty clear with you in the audience, uh, just talking to you about I mean, my old man ways, you know, theater or die, which I truly believe in. I've never seen the allure of festivals. Honestly, I don't really understand why people like festivals. I get how they help filmmakers. And as a filmmaker, I understand their value. But essentially, they're like screening uh, companies, right? Like they just screen a bunch of crap to try and elevate the best ones so that, you know, nobody who else are you going to. Is that they're like if, a strainer almost. It's if if I if I may steal a quote from Jonathan Wolf, the the director of uh, AFM. Yeah. It's a yeah. cult. It's a cultural event. It yeah. is it is a way for film lovers to get together and see art. It's all it is. It's never was meant to be business. It turned into that, especially at these bigger festivals. But um, it, it also makes no sense because you're giving over of your property, you're giving over your product, they're selling tickets to show your movie and they keep 100% of the money. It's like right. college it's like college athletes. Like yeah. it's amateurism. It, it, yeah, exactly. So, you know, 
if it wasn't for the filmmakers in the film, Sundance can't make any money at a festival. So it, it's a weird, and the only thing you trade off for that is awards, maybe sometimes cash rewards, maybe some attention, maybe something that can lead to distribution or something that can, you know, help you monetarily later or get an agent. Right, you a little, essentially like a little trophy to walk around and be like, look, I got the little trophy and they said that my movie's better than, you know, 95% of the movies that they, they got slung their way. And it's, it's, it's a cog in the wheel. I, I think that we could survive without festivals. I, from what I've seen of festivals in, in my 20 years of looking at festivals, I, I've been to like three, I went to TIFF a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I just I, I don't like watching four or five movies in one day. I don't think you're being fair to the movies when you watch four or five movies in one day. Uh, I I'm not a big fan of the festivals. I understand their purpose, but I think that we'd be OK with maybe 20 festivals total. You know, get rid you know, of it's 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 going to be interesting how this all shakes out, man. It's going to be a very interesting time. Um, and, w- and let me ask you one last question. What is the biggest lesson you learned from this entire process of making that your first feature? Uh, the business side is actually fun. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's not. It's I I was you know I already talked about it a little bit with you, but I you know, I guess the punk rock side of me growing up being you know anti-establishment, I'm like you know f that. I'm not gonna learn anything about the business side of. Th- I actually really like the business side of things, and there is a lot of uh, ways to continue to with the f you and f you to establishment, and you can actually do so m- more effectively if you understand the business side of things. So I I wish that I had not been so anti essentially afraid of the business side of things for as long as i was now what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business uh not specifically today but in this general time (laughs) yeah (laughs) pandemic notwithstanding uh just start shooting uh and and now you don't have an excuse i I had an excuse because when i first started wanting to make movies the, the digital was awful it looked like oh video. I, oh yeah terrible mm-hmm. and uh my excuse was i can't afford film which i couldn't now you can do it on your iphone and you if you don't believe me watch tangerines uh it's fantastic the tangerine or tangerines i've seen tangerine both. tangerine tangerines <laughs> is the foreign film about the two opposing uh war combatants that get harmed on the tangerine farmer's uh, property and then he mends them both back to, to hell wow. they get wow. better in his house and then they start fighting in his house it was really good tangerines but tangerine is what i'm talking about um with uh, sean baker uh yeah it just get your friends together have fun with it and see if it's for you a lot of people i think they think they want to direct and then when they give it a shot they're awful at it or or it's too scary or too intimidating or they just can't keep their mind straight so figure out if it's for you um earlier the better um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh man, this is, it, it seems like I, I, they're all the same answer, right? <laughs> uh, not being afraid of the business side of things. I okay. Mean, really, uh, pure artists, uh, they die poor, broken and lonely and alone. Yeah. And they cut their ear off. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then boring movies are made about them a hundred years later. <laughs> what are, and, and, uh, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, that's easy because I do that for, for my main my main mode of um, my main mode of mo- uh, making money is is talking movies and lists and stuff. So Clockwork Orange number one. Yes. Uh, I have a top five. Sure, go do <laughs> top five. Top five. Uh, um, Harold and Maude, uh, Midnight Cowboy, Goodfellas, and uh, Platoon. Platoon is the first movie that I saw. You know, upwards of over a dozen times in the theater, and that was the first time that I really connected with a movie to a, a, a extremes all right so then i'll give you top three kubrick films of all time since you're such a kubrick buff like i am you son of a bitch uh that also changes month to month uh but it's clockwork orange is number one and then i'm probably going 2001 depending on my mood and then uh the killing the killing nice I got him I do, I love the killing, killing. The killing so is it, the killing well, is amazing. Back to my movie, uh, Groupers. It's kind of I, it was definitely inspired as far as story structure with the killing, where where you're seeing different uh, different things happen in different times, and everyone's like, "Oh, Pulp Fiction." It's, it seems like Pulp Fiction, like Tarantino. I'm like, I stole from the same guy that Tarantino was stealing from. That's what you're seeing. <laughs> well, I will around. I will have to say, uh, inspired by sir. What I will yes, say, yes, yes, yes. Um, my favorite Kubrick. Uh, people are always shocked by this, but it's Eyes Wide Shut. Eyes. Yeah, I don't know. That's so funny. I was first in line. Okay, I'll be honest. Second in line at the Chinese theater opening day uh, to see Eyes Wide Shut. I saw mm-hmm. it. I had no idea if I was enjoying myself or if yeah, I liked yeah, it. Yep, I've seen yep, it. yep, yep, yep. 
three or four times since. I still don't know if I even like it. So, so I, I dislike it. So the thing with Otherwise Shut, because now everyone who's listened to me knows that I'm a huge Kubrick fan, and and I've 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 gone down that well too deep. Uh, sometimes I'm lost in there. But the reason why I love Eyes Wide Shut, I did the exact same thing in 1999. I was the first. I was first to go see it. I went to go see it. I walk out, and my friends and I are like, "Did you like it?" I'm like, "I don't know." But I'll probably, no, but I'll probably understand it in ten years, because that's yeah. what happens with all of his films. Like when you yeah. see them, you're like, "Well, eh, I don't get it." And then like ten years later, like, "Oh my god, this is an amazing film," um, and that's what happened with Eyes Wide Shut. Ten years later, I saw it. I was like, "This is really good." And then I saw it after I got married, and that that's a whole other level to it. Oh. Not that I'm in a sex cult thing, but but I get right. I understand what he was trying to say about love and about relationships and about these two fighting forces between a, a husband and wife. I get all of it, uh, and even then, I'm still probably missing a whole bunch of it. There's something yeah. very, there's still something extremely um, dreamlike. Every time I watch the movie, I feel like I'm in a dream, and he does that purposefully. He shot it purposefully to make you feel like it's a dream. There's like if you analyze the street. Like where where Tom Cruise is walking, it doesn't make sense. Like it's New York, but it really isn't New York because it was shot in right. London. So like you yeah. know that it's not New York, and it's not really supposed to. There's no street ever in New York that looked like that. So there's that whole that whole uh, vibe and stuff. So it, it it's such a unique film inside of his um inside of his filmography. But they're all unique. Yeah. I mean, I watch Clockwork Orange. Uh, like a year ago, and I'm like, how did this get made back then? Like how? Back then, how? Yeah. I'm like it couldn't get made now. There's no possible way that movie can be made now in the studio system. But back then, like in the first 25 minutes, the stuff that he got away with was well, yeah, he had left mind blowing. He had already left the studio system, right? Like because of his experience with Spartacus. Like he's like, I'm never gonna work for you guys again. I'm going off and doing my own thing, and I'm bailing. I'm actually going to a different country. Uh, but yeah, but, this, but he was uh, still, but uh, he was still working in the studio system. These were all Warner Brother films, and but they're all Warner Brother films. But he was like, oh no, he's he was outside kind of oh. with oh, an yeah. open, open checkbook. Yeah, correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, it's insane. But like Lolita was even more punk rock uh, at the time. I mean, making Lolita was just like he was a button pusher, and and I don't think he gets credit for being the button pusher that he was. And that's what he was. I mean, he was a, a, you know a genius filmmaker. But the subjects that he that he tackled, the fact that he gets you to root for a rapist is just unbelievable. Right. It, it's, how, how is that possible? I, like, I, again, I, I'm watching it and I'm like, it was made in the 70s. And you watch the first 30 minutes of Clockwork Orange and you're like, that's extreme for today. Like, if you put that on the screen today, it, people would be like, what? Like, here's a fun fact, Alex. Uh, a Clockwork Orange and Harold and Maude came out the same <laughs> weekend. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Two of the greatest films ever made, says me, uh, came out the same weekend, and they're what? so different, but they're they're both you know of the of their time for sure. Have you ever seen Room Two Thirty Seven? Please of tell course, me you've seen of that. Of course, yeah. I've seen yeah. Room Two Thirty Seven. Yeah, I've, I've seen any any documentary on Kubrick. I've probably watched. Yeah. Um, I've seen all the British ones. I've seen Boxes. I've seen all of it. I've seen all of it. I mean, I'm I'm such a Kubrick fanatic. It's it's not even funny. Um, I get like I, I hate Matthew Modine because he speaks ill of Stanley Kubrick. So I do I dislike Matthew Modine. I'm 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 crazy with it. I get a little crazy with it. Yeah, I know. I get you. Now, where can people find uh, you and and what you your shows and also the movie? Um, my website, which I'm in the middle of updating right now, it's very, very like early 2010s, but that's AndersonCowan.com, and the movie is available uh, on on Tubi and Amazon. It's on Tubi for for uh, AVOD, and on on Amazon and iTunes. It's called Groupers, and it's uh, it's a movie that I I I made with the idea of kind of mixing things up, having a hook. And, uh, you know, having something to say, too. And, and I want it to be memorable. And I'm hoping that, you know, anyone who sees this movie will want to see what I, what else I can, I can do and what I, what I can make next. So that's the idea of groupers. And uh, it's the kind of movie where you see it and you, you immediately want to start talking about what you just saw and, and, and what it really meant or what you were trying to figure out. Or, if, you know, it's this kind of movie you need to talk to people about after you see it. That's what I set out to do. Very and cool, man. Groupers. Groupersthemovie.com is a good place to go. Anderson, man, thank you for talking. I know we could talk for at least another three or four hours, but I appreciate I, uh, I appreciate your time and thank you for coming on and sharing your experience in this weird and wacky world that we call the film industry, man. So thanks again, brother. Thanks for having me, buddy. Good to see you.